Hello, my dear ones. May God bless you wherever you are. It feels like every time I talk to you about fasting, uh, my attention and your attention focuses on the tummy, as if everything that has to do with fasting is about the stomach. And of course, on a first superficial level, it is about the stomach because fasting implies eating less or being selective about what you eat. So something does happen in the stomach, through the stomach. But the reality is that the depth of fasting go so much more than the very short-lived temporary pain or discomfort of our stomachs. Fasting is a complete life changer, a complete reset of our spiritual lives. Because, well, because of many, many reasons, some of which we've discussed on this channel, and some of which we'll discuss in this video a bit later on. But the one thing that is central to my mind is the fact that fasting introduces us to silence. And silence is that sacred place in our hearts and our minds where we can move inwards and focus upon our own sinfulness and our own mortality. And sin and mortality, if you put them together the right way, they will lead to proper repentance. And repentance is the beginning of everything. There's no accident that the first teaching of St. John the Baptist and the first teaching of Christ himself as a man here on earth was repent. Repent, for the kingdom is at hand. Anyway, before we jump into this video, um, I want to explain to you why this video will look a bit weird. Uh, we've had such a full week at the monastery. By the grace of God, we've had three good, sunny, windless days. And that is a, an absolute miracle for us. And to make the miracle complete, we've also been blessed to have a few pilgrims here, so that we took advantage of them and of the sunshine and the lack of wind, and we built our greenhouse. Thank God we finally have our third greenhouse after the first two, the previous two, were, well, they decided that they feel better as parachutes and they ended up flying in one of our storms. But this is a much better, bigger, definitely more expensive greenhouse, and we hope by the grace of God that is going to stay in place for years or maybe God willing decades to come. The downside of um, all of the work that we've had to do is that my mind is not really focused on anything. So what I've done is I've selected two questions and two answers from our most a recent online meeting with the members of our online community. We've selected two questions that had to do with fasting, because for us the Orthodox land is in bloom, and uh, so it is relevant to talk about fasting. And because, by the grace of God, I feel that every time I address our online community, because they are such close friends, they are people who support us on a monthly basis for years, I open up and God gives me a grace I don't always have. Um, <clears throat> I will mention the online community because it is one of the main ways in which you can support the monasteries here on Malan Iona if you would like to. Uh, they provide this opportunity so that we can talk, we can answer questions uh, through our online meetings. They provide you with an extra video per week with news concerning the monasteries, the work we've done, the hopes we have, what has happened in the community. There are emails, there are, there's a sort of a micro-blog news sort of thing where every day almost we post something that is happening of the monastery. Something, sometimes things happen like we have a horrible storm, we need to stay in because otherwise we will learn how to fly quicker than we want to. Other times there are more important things. There's also an emergency prayer request sort of thing, where if you go through something today that you know requires the support of, um, of someone's prayer, just post your name and your requests and we are there and we are here 
and we can support you in prayer. It's important that we are supported consistently every month because that takes away the pressure, for example, for me to travel as much as I have in the past. And if I don't travel as much, I can keep recording these videos for all of you and we can start writing booklets again. And um, <clears throat> maybe, God willing, I'm not going to end up in hospital again and I'm going to end up living a little bit longer, which, who knows, could be a good thing for some people. Anyway, I hope that what comes the answer to these two questions about fasting will benefit you we love you in christ we pray for you always and you are regardless of how or if you support us you are part of our community so may god bless you beyond your wildest dreams my beloved ones amen 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 <laughs> Thou who at the ninth hour for our sakes didst taste of death in the flesh, mortify our carnal mind, O Christ God, and save us. Let my supplication draw nigh before the Lord. Yeah, well, I can I can fully understand the the migraine problem because I I get one every day, uh, almost in the in fasting, uh, and in that sense. My fasting is not complete because I do take my medication. I don't take it with water. I I just swallow it dry. But uh, I do take a small pill basically every day. Um, assuming that medically you can fast, I mean, the benefits of fasting are so many and so varied. Um, I'd like to first say that it's not... See... It's like food for the body. All these tools, all these, we call them ascetic struggles. They are like food for the body. You could survive with only one. You could survive if you ate just bananas. You probably could survive for a long time or just bread or something. You are not going to be as healthy as you could be. And you are not going to be, who, you're not going to reach your potential physically. You're not going to be the, the healthy person God created you to be, able to do everything he wants you to do, able to fill his command, fulfill his commandments and everything. You are going to be someone who basically survives. And that can be done spiritually as well. You can just survive by eating just one spiritual food. For example, being merciful. You can do that. And you can be saved. Uh, I think... I think today we celebrate, um, I don't think he has a name. Does he have a name, Father Philan? That lazy monk who did nothing, he doesn't have a name, which is interesting, that he's commemorated in the Synaxarian with all the saints that we celebrate today, but they don't retain his name. His, uh, uh, the story is that he was one of the monastics in a monastery, I can't remember where, and he was known to be very lazy, non-fasting, kind of, you know, not going to church, not doing his obedience and all of that. And then the time came for him to die, quite quite young, which again is interesting. He died young, like someone who only eats one type of food. He didn't reach his full potential. And he was extremely joyful in his last moments. And those around him asked him, how come you're so joyful? Basically implying we expected you to be in hell by now. <laughs> but, you know, this is a monastery. You can be a bit more abrupt with people. And he said, trust me that when I've seen the angels coming and you know, be looking reproachful and everything because I've done nothing in my life. I've told my angels that Christ has said that the one who does not judge anyone will not be judged. And I put my trust that the words of him who said these are still alive. And this is my hope of salvation. And he was saved simply for doing that one particular thing throughout his whole monastic life. He had not judged anyone since the moment he entered into the monastery. And for that, he was saved. But he was kind of only barely just saved. 
And you can see that in the story itself, the fact that he dies young, the fact that although he's included with the saints, he's the only one whose name is not remembered, is not retained. You can't pray to him. He was saved, but not as a saint to whom you pray. And I, I wanted to share that because it's important for you to understand that you can't replace fasting with something else. You still need to fast to the best, uh, to the be as best as you can. Uh, but it's not like if you keep all night vigil, you replace fully the fasting. Something is missing there. Of course, if God and God knows everything has allowed that you are in such a physical state with your health that you cannot fast at all, God can do everything. And, you know, you can just, in that case, we are not commenting what God can do. We are talking based only on our human experience. So I would always encourage you to think, yes, I can up my non-judgment and my kindness, and I can rein in my anger and uh, everything else, my lust, my greed. Uh, but don't refrain from fasting if you can medically fast because there are benefits that come to you only from fasting. The simple fact that it's the most, I think it's the primordial instinct that we have. Every human organism needs to eat something, consume something in order to survive. And you take that away or you limit that. You are fighting with an instinct. You are, you are telling yourself indirectly that I could die out of this, but I'm ready for this in order to follow Christ's commandment. Um, you also fast because it is one of Christ's direct commandments. He tells us to pray and fast if we want to defeat, you know, the spirits that torment us and those around us. We follow the fasting as an obedience to the church herself because from Christ's time, all the way to our time, fasting was part of our experience. I mean, Christ himself, God, man himself, fasted. And it's mentioned that he fasted. He kept the 40, complete, 40 days of complete fast, apart from other, um, uh, you know, smaller periods of fasting. So it's an act of obedience towards the church. It makes you one, not only with the church today, but with the church as it was throughout the centuries, all those strugglers, spiritual strugglers who fasted, you become one with them, you become one of the army, one of the, yeah, the army, the body of the church. And, and there's great, great help coming from that obedience and from shielding yourself with becoming part again of, of the, the body of the church. Um, for me, something that I think about and it's not something that's mentioned as being the most important thing in the fathers. Uh, it is mentioned, but it became almost the most important thing for me. And I've, I've shared this with the community at the beginning of Lent this year. For me, first of all, it's the need for me to be able to control um, this instability in my spiritual fight. You, you you actually mentioned it. I can fast, but then I get a migraine. And then I reconsider my fasting. I should be unshakable in my dedication and obedience to Christ. So if I started a battle, I should know that a battle implies opposition. If you go and you fight someone, that someone is going to kick back. Otherwise, it's not a battle. So I need to be able to become stable unshakable in my struggle, in my fight for my salvation. And so I need to be able to keep fasting, to keep this line of fasting, whether or not I feel like it, whether or not it is comfortable, whether I feel saddened or depressed by it or overjoyed or, you know, even the fact that I break the fast after the three days, although that's when I feel most peaceful and I feel grace with me, I do it because that's that's what the rule is, that you should fast it, that, it, that you should stop it then. And that's one thing, fighting instincts, moods, emotions, changing our minds in order to do something constant, consistent. And then what I was saying, what's 
for me personally, the most important uh, thing I've always thought of fasting, particularly learned, particularly abrupt, kind of a violent, complete fasting, as a good rehearsal for the time of my death. Because most people I've seen dying, and I've been blessed to to be present and to help by prayer and by a good word, quite a number of people, because I'm a priest, I'm a monk, I've seen people die, I've been there as they die. Most people, unless it's an accident or a heart attack or a stroke, before we die, we go through a period of a few days or a few weeks or in some cases months or even years if you battle something like dementia for instance where you are exactly as one is after three four five days of complete fast i notice the same thing the same lack of energy the same wide open mouth struggling to breathe in because there's no water there's no saliva uh, the same you know weakened body that can't even digest the food let alone e ingest it uh, e eat it uh, and i think to myself well i'd better be able to pray before i die so what why do I think that I will be ready? Because we all have this fantasy that before we die, we are going to be so so strong in our prayer. We are going to just shine then. If I can't do it now, when I'm young and healthy, I just take away food from myself. Why do I think that I'm going to be able to meet my death and then meet Christ with prayer, when I'm going to be much older, God willing, weakened by, by, by the disease that has brought me there, and by the sadness and fear that comes with approaching death, why do I think that that's going to be a better position for me to pray than now? So I think of these moments of fasting as rehearsals for that final moment, for that final period, when slowly, slowly life is ebbing away from your body, and I still want to be able spiritually to pray. I still want to be able spiritually to orient myself towards Christ. I still want to be able spiritually to fight depression and fear and darkness, and to always find reason for hope, find reason for uh, light, looking ahead to the approaching moment of judgment. Nothing but fasting can do that to your body. And it's it's exactly when you feel like, oh, I want to give up fasting, that all of these things actually kick in. So for me, that's it, it's it's something personal because I've always had this uh, blessed fear of death. I call it blessed because it's the reason why I left the world and I became a monastic. So it became the engine of my life. And I've discovered that fasting in particular helps me prepare like nothing else for those those last moments. Supplication draw nigh before thee, O Lord. According to thine oracle, give me understanding. Thou who at the ninth hour for our sakes didst taste of death in the flesh, mortify our carnal mind, O Christ God, and save us. Let my petition come before thee, O Lord. Before we get the, I mean, there are a few things that um, pop in my mind while you are talking. First one is, uh, I would. I hope that when you try to do this, you try to do this with the blessing and the advice of your spiritual father, your parish priest. So make sure someone else at least blesses that you do this, if not takes the initiative. I think that's the main difference um, between how things happen in the world and how things happen in a monastery. And I can see the difference in the same person here in the community. If that person comes to me and says, oh, I would like to try a bit more, I don't know, not to eat tomorrow, and then I bless it, that is a blessed thing. Uh, but that's not even 1% of what it is when I go myself to that person and I say, I don't want you to eat tomorrow. 
and that's immensely more blessed, but it is also immensely more difficult for them to do. Because in, in the one case, you are the one that makes the choice. You look at yourself, your spiritual state, you kind of put a diagnosis on yourself, and you decide that maybe the right treatment is this. And then most people will just go ahead and do it. Even if they succeed, that's not much of a success. The few people who, by the grace of God, have a bit of experience and a deeper understanding will approach their parish priest and their spiritual father, and they will ask for a blessing. That is a lot more beneficial, but it's not yet at the level of having been asked to do that by someone else, someone else's will. That's, I think, one of the differences between living in a monastery where you have a spiritual father who has the time to, not that I have the time to think about them, that's all I do all day. All I do all day is I pray for them and I worry about them and I think about each of them, what I should be doing, and then I assess, can I ask them to do something or should I wait a bit more? What can I ask them? What would be good based on what I've seen and all of that? I mean, that's my... I don't have much else in my brain. Everything else is, you know, secondary, kind of at the outskirts of my brain. In the world, uh, a parish priest simply doesn't have the time to to invest that sort of of care uh, and of of presence, of spiritual presence in your life. Uh, so I, I just wanted to say one. I, I pray that you do this with at least the blessing of your priest, if not at his initiative. Uh, secondly, keep in mind that it's not always about food. I mean, of course you fast and you should fast, but maybe food is not the right or the best tool for you. I remember um, St. Seraphim, uh, one of the advice that he gave, gave his spiritual children was he would tell them this story that when he went into the monastery, he tried everything. And he said, I, I remembered my father, his, you know, bodily father, physical father, who had um, a shop. And he would bring all sorts of goods into the shop. He would bring 50 of them. And then he would see in a month which of those 50 would sell most. And then he would only order the 10 that sold most. And those become staples, permanent staples of the shop. And then he would buy 50 other items and see which of those sold most. And he would only keep the 10 that sold most and so on and so forth. And in that way, he maximized the profit that the shop made by the using the best by using in the best way the space available to him and Father, Saint Seraphim said that I'm doing the same thing spiritually I will try everything and then I take notice through my spiritual father which of these tools benefit me most which of these tools bring me most spiritual profit and for some people, it will be fasting. For other people, it will be vigil. For other people, it will be sacrificing time and effort and maybe uh, taking time from the, off from their job to go to the services and be part of that sort of prayer. For other people, it will be, it will be time alone. So they'll need to find a time to be alone, go in, I don't know, in a forest somewhere or take a day out of the week and hide somewhere or create a space in your, I don't know, basement or garden, your shed, your anywhere. We, we, are, we are all very, very different. And it is important as we grow to try everything and to continue to do everything, but to emphasize and to make the most of those particular things that bring us most spiritual profit. And it may be that for you, given the context of your life, it may be that it's not fasting. I'm not saying don't fast, hear me. It may be that it's not about you not eating a full day. It may be that you have to do something else. Maybe try a little prayer in, in the evening, later in the evening, or earlier in the morning, or waking up in the night, or trying to be, I don't know. For some people, 
it's a social thing. Maybe if you try to get involved into helping the homeless where you live or cooking for, for them or uh, cooking, doing something physically and sending that food somewhere. I mean, there are so many things that you could and you should try. And then you'll feel in your heart what brings more grace, what brings more profit to you. So don't get obsessed with the fasting. Of course, it would be good. And um, I, I, I give glory to God that you try even to, to fast a bit more. But you are working uh, and you have a demanding job and you also have your family to consider and all of that. So maybe that's not the right tool for you at this moment. And finally, what you said about the the good envy, which is a blessed thing towards monastics. Keep in mind again that if you could take three days off your job, you might be in a better position to keep the fasting as monastics do. We still work. The first day we work almost like any other day. But then I'm very, very careful what they do day two, day three, and even the days afterwards. I mean, I... I am very careful. Nobody's going to drive during those days if we can, you know, avoid it. It's funny that I said this because you see, we actually had to commute between the uh, uh, monastery and the pilgrimage house, so we drove every day. But <laughs> we we were very careful. So what I'm trying to say is that we we not. It's not that we have some sort of superpower. We have the context that allows us to try this more. And it becomes the focus of everything. Even, I mean, we consider what we eat the, the week before we gradually decrease the amount of food that we eat. And that actually helps enormously. Whereas I remember when I was in the world, and even in a monastery as a young monk, I wanted to eat everything. I felt like I have to eat today on Sunday for the duration of the week ahead, or if possible, for the whole Lent ahead. And that's extremely wrong. I had to learn from the older monks that actually, if you reduce it gradually, your tummy reduces as well, and you don't experience hunger anymore. And they, the monks in, in Moldavia, have also taught me, and now I'm teaching them, that if the last thing you eat before you start the fasting is a lot of yogurt, or something like that, yogurt or kefir, you are not experiencing thirst. I mean, you do, but not to the degree that you would otherwise. I remember the first few years when I didn't know this, the first two years at least, my, my lips cracked. I had blood coming out of my mouth. I looked like a vampire from Transylvania. My skin cracked around my eyes, on my hand. Uh, it, it was horrendous. This year I had no problem. I couldn't speak because my mouth was so dry that I, I, I had no saliva. I had no problem whatsoever this year, by the grace of God. So there's there's a context, there's an experience, there's a community that supports you. Everybody is aware that we are doing all these things. And even within a monastery, even within our monasteries, every single one of us has his or her own way of going through those three days, depending on everything from age, um, health, even spiritual state in that particular week. So, honestly, it, it's a good thing to look at monastics and to look at not only monastics, but everyone who does something a bit more than we do, because that uh, inspires us to, to, to try a bit more. But at the same time, keep in mind the reality of your life and the reality of life, life in a monastery. God bless you. Have a beautiful, kind, gentle land, everyone. Amen, amen, amen. amen. We all send our prayers and our love. Deliver me. Thou who at the ninth hour for our sake didst taste of death in the flesh, mortify our carnal mind, O Christ God, and save us.